I'd like to start by extending thanks to the alumni and faculty presenters from the classroom sessions, and I, I hope that you enjoyed them very much. Now we are uh, grateful and very fortunate to have with us Steve Case, known to many of you as the member of the class of 1980, and all of you, I'm sure, as the co-founder of America Online. He's been up to a whole lot more since starting AOL in 1985, and I'm glad that he's here to talk with us about what he's been doing and to share his perspective on the massive changes that we've seen in the internet and the changes in its role on our lives over the last 30 years. And we'll save some time at the end. We'll talk for a while and save some time at the end for questions from all of you, uh, making sure that we can get over to the reception over in the Bentley Reserve Building, which is going to start at 6. So I have a timekeeper who will uh, put an end to this at the appropriate <laughs> moment. Um, very important part of the program. Uh, so let me start by uh, giving a little background on Steve. Uh, Steve has always been an entrepreneur. His first partner was his older brother, Daniel, with whom he shared a paper route, sold seeds and magazine subscriptions, and started a mail order company that they called uh, Case Enterprises, very pretty, ambitiously. Pretty clever, huh? Yeah. <laughs> branding so, genius. Yeah, it's branding genius, yeah. <laughs> Daniel went off to Princeton because he couldn't get into Williams. No, Daniel, <laughs> Daniel went off to Princeton and Steve, like his father, came to Williams. He studied political science as he cultivated campus startups, one time convincing parents to buy fruit baskets for their kids during finals. I'm sure those kids appreciated those fruit baskets. <laughs> the parents After, were the only one with the money. That's right. why you have to target the parents. <laughs> After college, Steve went to work building brands for Procter & Gamble. But it was his co-founding of America Online in 1985 that made him among America's best known. Right. Oh, the parade. Uh, right. This will be interesting. Uh, <laughs> that made him among America's best known and most accomplished entrepreneurs. Under his leadership, AOL became the world's largest and most valuable internet company. At AOL's peak, nearly half of internet users in the US used AOL. In 2000, Steve negotiated the largest merger in business history, bringing together AOL and Time Warner. In 2005, he co-founded the DC-based investment firm Revolution. Steve has served as founding chair of the Startup America Partnership, a presidential ambassador for global entrepreneurship, and a member of President Obama's Council on Jobs and Competitiveness. And he devotes a great deal of his, of his energy to philanthropy as chair of the Case Foundation which he and his wife, Jean, established in 1997. So uh, I'm going to start by. I think, I think with that introduction, we're now out of time and the parade yeah, is know. starting. So thanks for coming. Let's go watch the parade. That's great. We'll go to the reception now. No. Um, so I'm going to start by asking you about, uh, about your road tripping, um, kind of a uh, probably different road tripping than you were doing at Williams. But in September, you went on your fourth Rise of the Rest bus tour. Bringing, your total to, bringing it to a total of 19 cities visited and nearly $2 million invested in companies along the way. So could you explain what is Rise of the Rest and what are these tours all about? Sure. Well, first of all, it's great to be here. I look forward to the uh, discussion and, and the, uh, it's great to have opportunities to get people back together, uh, particularly talking about kind of topics of, of, uh, of the day. But in terms of the specific question, and it's kind of funny saying that here, at, in San Francisco, kind of the epicenter of, of uh, innovation, obviously with Silicon Valley and everything's happening in the, in the city and around the city. Uh, but I believe that the next wave of entrepreneurship is gonna be more regional and more global. And while San Francisco and the area around San Francisco will continue to have the lead and other areas like, like Boston and New York will continue to be very strong, you'll see a, a, a evening out of entrepreneurship across the country and across the world. And so, uh, the rise of the rest is really it's actually a line that Fareed Zakaria you know, coined about a decade ago talking about how the United States still could be strong, but you'll see the rise of nations like China and India and the relative balance of power will shift over time, which not to say the United States will get weak or to say Silicon Valley will get weak, but to say the rise will kind of help uh, a lot of regions around the country and around the world become more entrepreneurial. So that's sort of the notion of rise of the rest. Last year, 75% of venture capital went to three states, California, congratulations, uh, New York, and Massachusetts, 75%, three states. Uh, the other 47 states fought over the other 25%, uh, 
but that does not, in my opinion, re reflect the, the actual distribution of great entrepreneurs with great ideas building great companies. It's more of a historical kind of a dynamic based on where most of the investment capital had been had been based, and over time that will you know, that will shift, and some things in play uh, are starting to accelerate uh, that shift. So the rise of we get on the bus and travel around, we visit places like Detroit and Pittsburgh and Kansas City and Nashville and New Orleans and Madison, Minneapolis, that are you know great American cities with actually great histories, but I think also great futures because they're becoming stronger uh, entrepreneurial uh, regions. And some of that will accelerate in the next wave of innovation where a lot of the companies that are successful will need to have partnerships with some of the incumbents. And 75% of the Fortune 500 companies are in those 47 states. They're in the middle of the country. And so there will be a, a dynamic that will develop over the next you know, 10, 15 years that will result in this area continuing to be very strong, indeed continuing to be in the lead, but other regions rising. And we're trying to shine a spotlight on that and help do what we can to promote the regions uh, all around the country. So uh, I'm kind of curious to what happens when the bus tour comes to a city. So suppose you came to North Adams in Williamstown, hotbed of uh, Might be a little small for us, but. <laughs> but uh, but what, what do you do when you, when, you, when you get there? What happens when the bus well, arrives? Well, it's, it's really uh, a number of things are happening. We're, we're trying to get, use it as a vehicle to get the community working together more collaboratively. So we'll invite on the bus the university presidents or the, the mayor or the governor or, or, or uh, you know, the leaders of the companies, the major companies in that area, as well as getting the entrepreneurs there. And we also invite investors, venture capitalists from other places, including San Francisco, to, to, to join it. So it's a little bit of a mashup, trying to kind of connect people and create some some collisions because it, that's how you really accelerate these regions. It's you know how do you create more network density? Uh, and so, for example, in Detroit, which is the first one we did, and by the way, it's worth it's worth uh, remembering that 75 years ago, Detroit was Silicon Valley. Detroit was the most innovative city in the country when the car was the hot technology of the day. 75 years ago, by the way, Silicon Valley was like apple orchards, uh, <laughs> and so you know, Detroit was on fire, growing like crazy. You know, opening you know, schools and libraries and, you know, and all kinds of stuff because the momentum was really, really strong there. But then kind of lost, it lost its way in a global market uh, in the last half century, lost 60% of its population and went bankrupt. And it was Silicon Valley 75 years ago. So that's why we started out there to kind of, kind of show that it's fighting its way back, particularly in the downtown area. So there we had, there's an entrepreneur, very successful entrepreneur, Dan Gilbert, who's doing a lot of things around entrepreneurship there. The mayor was there, the governor. Uh, was there, and we just were trying to shine a spotlight within the community, but also try to create kind of national visibility uh, for the story of uh, Detroit. One of the companies we we met there, a company called Shinola, uh, that's trying to you know rebuild manufacturing and, and handcrafted good watches and other things in Detroit. It's already created a couple thousand jobs and just started five years ago. We made a fifty million dollar investment in that company after we left. So there are really interesting companies that are you know happening in these in these in these cities. And we're just trying to do what we can to help, help create a little bit more of that density, a little bit more of that momentum, and then tell the story. Uh, and my guess is some of you will, in fact, most of you will still be here 15 years from now. Uh, but some of you will you know, end up going back to a place like you know, Detroit, maybe you're from there, or back to a place like Nashville, maybe you went to you know, school there. Because you'll have a sense that that will create an opportunity that not only to create a very interesting company or join a very interesting company, but also fit more in terms of your, you know, kind of lifestyle or family priorities or other or cost of living kind of issue here. But you know, there are a lot of different things that are happening. And it's not again, it's not to suggest anything is going to happen abruptly or anything's going to happen that's going to you know significantly result in a decline in the level of innovation uh, and investment uh, in, in this region. But I do think you'll see a rise. You're already beginning to see it. There are already companies that are showing kind of breakout success in other places, and that will accelerate in the next decade. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to ask you, just turn a little bit and ask you about a little bit about the book that you're working on. It's a book, I believe, that explores what you see as the three waves of the internet. Um, so tell us about the third wave and how maybe that does or doesn't fit with the rest of the rest bus tour. Well, it does fit. First of all, I should say I first was inspired by a book called The Third Wave uh, by Alvin Toffler when I was at Williams. Uh, and I read it when I was in my senior year of, of Williams. I was just completely captivated by it. It was, a, it was a view of how someday we live in more uh, electronic frontier and different services would 
you know, be available. And, and even though none of that existed then, even PCs didn't really exist then, uh, I, just knew, I just knew he was right. And so it inspired me to kind of do that. And it took me more than a decade before I kind of got, finally figured it out and got some, you know, some traction. Uh, but it was inspiring. His view of the, third, the three ways were sort of the agricultural you know, revolution, then the industrial revolution, and then the technology, the digital you know, revolution. So when I was thinking of doing a book, I decided to kind of borrow that idea from, from him, uh, but are talking about three different waves, which are the, really the waves of the internet over the past 30 years or so, and what I think will happen in the next you know, 15 or, or 20 years. The first wave, companies like AOL, but also Cisco and Yahoo and many others played a key role there, was just building the internet, building awareness of the internet. I know it seems crazy now, but when we started AOL, only 3% of people were online. And those 3% were only online one hour a week. So it was, you know, when we said we wanted to get America online, like, we're, we're dead serious. And there are a whole host of reasons why most people didn't, most people didn't have PCs. The few people had PCs, most of them didn't have modems, couldn't communicate. You actually had to go to the peripheral section of the computer store to get this thing called a modem and figure out how to plug it in. If you were able to connect, it cost you about $10 an hour to be connected, which is kind of a, you know, limits one's freedom to kind of browse. So there are a whole host of things that took a bunch of years to break through to build the core foundation of the internet and build the on-ramps to it and build the visibility and the, you know, kind of a momentum around it. And that really was the, you know, the first wave, sort of 85 to 2000 or so. And then the last 15 years, uh, the second wave has really been building on top of the internet. It's been the app economy. It's been mobility and, and a whole host of whether it be Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat or Waze or a whole host of applications have emerged because they could take for granted that infrastructure was there, the foundation of the internet was there, the focus was on, on apps with you know, lean startups and engineers and you know, dorm, dorm inspired uh, kind of companies like a Facebook or, or Snapchat being kind of the most iconic of, this, of, the, of the second wave. And those opportunities to build apps and services on top of the internet will continue to exist but I think the third wave is beginning, beginning to build momentum. And that, I think, is going to be a, a wave where you really are integrating the internet in much more seamless and pervasive ways in really every aspect of our lives. And the process disrupting some of the biggest industries we've got, like education and healthcare and food and transportation and energy and you know, a lot of financial services. And so it's a kind of jump ball in terms of this, this new wave, this new era. But, which leads me to answer your question about why I wrote the book and framed it this way, my belief is the skill set for entrepreneurs to be successful in the third wave is going to be different than the skill set in the second wave and more like the skill set in the first wave. So telling a little bit of the history of the first wave will help inform people for the, for the future, in, in, in particular in the, in the Second way, because it was about apps, it was about software, it was about trying to figure out some way to get viral adoption and then figure out some way to you know, monetize. But it basically was, as I said, about lean startups. It was just trying to break through and, and, and get noticed. But it was about the app in the, in the third wave. If you really are going to disrupt healthcare, you're going to have to partner with hospitals and health plans. If you really want to disrupt education, you're going to have to partner with schools or, 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 or universities. You can't go it alone. It's not just the app. And so a skill set of, of creating partnerships is going to become critically important. We would not have had a first way without partnerships. There was no company could do it on their own. And the, there's an African proverb that I think will really kind of animate the third way, which is if you want to go quickly, you can go alone. But if you want to go far, you must go together, which is really the spirit of partnership and collaboration, a critical skill set for entrepreneurs. Not that needed in the, sec in the second wave, critically important in the third wave. Another is, is engagement on policy, government, regulations. Now, people don't like to hear that because most entrepreneurs get frustrated with the idea of government slowing them down. But these are industries that are regulated. They're going to continue to be regulated. Uh, and you, the companies that don't understand that and don't have a strategy around policy will get left behind. So in some ways, the first wave was about kind of technology risk. Can you build it? The second wave was kind of about market risk. Can you drive adoption of it? The third wave will increasingly be about partner 
and policy, you know, is can you establish the partnerships to get traction with your business and can you navigate the rules of the road to, 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 to be you know, kind of effective in that, in that way. So it's a little bit different skill set. So how does that you know, emphasis on, on partnership and large collaborations that, that you see coming as being important in this next wave, how does that fit with this notion of the rise or the rest that there will be a very distributed kind of set of places that, that this innovation takes place. You might have thought naively that that would drive things to a few innovation hubs and that if you were off in Nashville, it would be hard to make those partnerships. So how do those well, fit together? It depends on the industry. And, and I think the other skill set I think is going to be a, a tricky balance, but it's going to be important in the third wave, is balancing sort of a naivete about an industry that allows you to ask fresh questions and have fresh insights. And a lot of people say one of the great things about entrepreneurs is, is they really don't understand what, what they're dealing with and as a result can bring kind of a fresh perspective you know, to it. You know, the founders of PayPal famously said, for example, if we'd ever been working at a credit card company, we never would have thought of it the way we thought of it. So there's a sort of this, kind of this, in you know, the second wave, ignorance was in fact bliss. You know, naivete was in some ways a competitive advantage. And that will continue to an extent but I think in, these, in these, some of these industries that are ripe for disruption, I think that mentality could get you in trouble. And having a, a sense of, you know, some, some sense of the history of the industry, some credibility in, in, in terms of establishing partnerships will become increasingly important, which does tie in with the rise of the rest because many of the you know, leading companies in each of these industries are in other places. So for example, Nashville happens to be a, a great city around health IT. There's a lot of health companies, a lot Madison, Wisconsin. Baltimore, because of Hopkins, as you well know, these, these actually are showing real momentum around uh, things like uh, health. New Orleans is emerging as one of the really interesting education software, ed tech you know, uh, places, because after Katrina, thousands of people came there. A lot of them from Teach for America, a bunch of them stayed. There's now 100 startups focusing on education. And because they had to reinvent their school system, it's easier to get new, innovative products and services uh, kind of on in, you know, going in schools in New Orleans than any other place in the country. So it's sort of become this robust laboratory for, for uh, experimentation. If you care about ag tech, agriculture or food, uh, the, uh, St. Louis and Louisville are going to be two interesting cities. One of the most powerful companies, some people don't like them, but nobody would uh, debate how important they are, is Monsanto, which is in St. Louis. They have like 100,000 PhDs that are engineers who really understand this, that, that side of things, and some of those will end up you know, going off and doing some startups, many of them will probably be in the in the in the St. Louis area. So I think it, 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 the notion of the third wave, it's a different phenomenon uh, than the rise of the rest. But I think in the next decade they'll start blurring together. And there's one third kind of uh, you know piece that will get integrated, which is the whole idea of impact investing. There's a growing you know, sense, particularly around young people, that it's not good enough to just focus on profit. You also have to focus on purpose, focus on impact. And just in the last few years, there have been now 1,500 benefit corporations, B Corps, that have been formalized, including some that have gone public, like you know, Etsy and Patagonia and other, other companies that uh, Kickstarter have adopted that, that, that model. And, and they, you know, that basically says we're trying to build a business, a valuable business, successful business. Of course, we care about profit. But we're also going to measure impact. It might be job creation it might be environmental impact, you know, a lot of different ways to measure it, but you're going to pick something to measure and report on that. Uh, and that whole area of impact investing is building some momentum. And my guess is you rise the rest will continue on its own, third wave will continue on its own, impact investing will continue on its own, but they'll start converging in the next decade, which will end up accelerating all three of those kind of trends. Yeah. So if we think about, so we're educators, at least right. I, you know, I am those of us at Williams, and we're thinking about uh, preparing young people to enter this world, this third wave uh, of the internet. And how should we be thinking about the, the, the capacities that, that students need? I mean, is that changing? Uh, how do places like Williams, liberal arts colleges fit in to that? Uh, how would you ad advise us to, to think about educating young people to be effective in this world that's coming? Well, it's complicated. I think it's, it's sort of, uh also kind of multifaceted. I mean, bottom line is a school like Williams is going to continue to do well and be very well positioned. But there will be a lot of you know, colleges and universities that do come under a lot of pressure and there will be in some ways sort of disintermediation, unbundling of some of the, you know, the services that people think of as, 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 a, as an 
uh, the college education. But Williams and you know, obviously others will, will kind of continue to be above that. And part of the reason for that is in the educational uh, technology world, and this goes back to the sometimes the technologists are looking at it in a way that doesn't fully understand what's happening in terms of, of that, that sector, that segment, uh, is a lot of the focus in the last five years has been around content. Yeah. How do you put content into the cloud? And you know, the whole phenomenon of MOOCs are you know, kind of massively open courses with a perfect e example of that. And there is an important role for digitizing content, unleashing it, you know, allowing people to access it, particularly people around the world who otherwise wouldn't have access to it. But content is actually not in of itself the be all end all. Context matters as well. You know, and, and even the context of a, a, a degree from a Williams is more credible than a degree from other places. And that basically says not just about what you learn, but you know, where, where that was does matter. And community matters as well. Both the community when you're learning, how do you learn from each other, and, and, and kind of, you know, obviously the you know, Williams does, does that quite, uh, quite successfully. And then how do you have a continuing community like events like this, you know, even after you've technically left you know, college? So it's content plus context plus community. Uh, I, think, I think those are the key things to, to focus on. I think in terms of this, this next wave, this third wave, actually will advantage people with liberal arts degrees because the second wave has been a little bit more engineering centric. Do you understand coding? And that will continue to be important. But if in fact partnerships become more important, that's a kind of different skill set. If in fact uh, policy becomes more important, that's kind of a different uh, skill set. And at the core, entrepreneurs basically are good at pattern recognition. They see a lot of stuff and they say, hmm, feels like something's happening there. And then they have the confidence to pursue that even though the risk associated with that is, is pretty high. And, and so it, it, that, that pattern recognition is one of the great skills of liberal arts education, knowing yeah. a little bit about a lot of things and figuring out how to connect the dots and then figure out a way to communicate that effectively and pervasive, per, persuasively uh, and clearly uh, is, is important, it has always been important, it will likely be more important in the, in the third wave. And then just encouraging people to think out of the box, challenge some of the, you know, the core assumptions and bring kind of those fresh insights uh, is always going to be a, a, a key skill set. Yeah. So uh, that's a nice advertisement for what we do. Um, I like it very much. I'm not going to try to improve on it. Um, so you've mentioned policy a couple of times. Uh, and I just want to kind of turn to that and ask you a little bit about that. Um, so you're a member of Obama's Jobs Council, and you helped to bring about bipartisan support for the uh, Jobs Act in, in 2012. And so you, one of the things you said, you said it already tonight, is that um, the right kind of policy regime is important for, for entrepreneurship. Can you expand on that a little bit? Well, what, what, is the, what do we need to be doing in the policy area to encourage entrepreneurship in this country? There are a bunch of things, some of which you know, we did through the uh, recommendations we, we made, some which are in place, some of which we're still you know, working on. But the, you know, I think at the core, one of the great concerns I have, great frustrations I have, is there's sort of this disconnect between Silicon Valley and DC. They're kind of like not talking past, either not talking at all or talking past each other. And that's not going to be helpful in the, as we enter this, this third wave and figuring out ways to have more constructive engagement. But generally what happens in DC, I live in DC, I've lived there for 30 years, that's where we started AOL, so I see this, is companies, when they're getting started, completely ignore the government. It's like, yeah, I don't care less and only get involved when they are, feel like it's time to start playing defense. As, you know, Facebook, when privacy started becoming a, an, an issue, or Uber now has opened up an, an actually in our building in DC, like two floors, because now they say, oh, I guess you know, suddenly this is getting more complicated than we, we, we thought of it. Uh, and so they, 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 kind of, they basically go from just ignoring it uh, to very limited tactical and frankly, selfish engagement. They're really only engaging on the topics of their particular, the, um, their particular agenda, and they you know, come to DC for a couple of days, have a bunch of meetings, and, and, and fly back. And, and they don't really have any broader engagement around the broader kind of national uh, interests. I think we need more of that kind of engagement. Uh, and so, so there is a role for entrepreneurs, whether it be here or in other parts of the country, to, to kind of engage. But there also is, on the other side, the government needs to get its act together. Yeah. And it's not, it's not nimble, it's not flexible, 
Uh, it needs to rethink some of the regulations in this in this new world, particularly with the third wave, there'll be the convergence of a lot of different technologies and, and different industries and business models, and that's, they tend to be regulated in silos and, and different committees of Congress manage this versus that. So having a more kind of broader integrated view of it's gonna become more important. So taking a fresh look at, at regulations, taking a, a fresh look at access to capital and some of the things that the Jobs Act did in terms of crowdfunding and on-ramp for IPOs, things like that have been important, but they're still you know, work to be done. Immigration reform is critical. We're not going to remain the most innovative entrepreneurial nation if we don't win what's now a global battle for talent, and we're starting to lose that battle. And and so immigration, which is you know, a complicated issue and an emotional issue for for a lot of people, but I view it less as a problem to solve and more as an opportunity to seize if we're going to continue to kind of be the the magnet that attracts people from all over the world, not just to come to get education, but to start companies here. And, and scale companies here and, and create you know, great jobs here. So it's a mix of different things that, that it re requires some fresh thinking on I think, both sides, uh, and hopefully that will, will happen. So if you look uh, so beyond the borders of the United States and ask the question, you know, what ought to happen globally to encourage entrepreneurship and innovation, particularly in parts of the world that are less economically developed. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. No, we've actually done some work. My wife, Jean, runs our Case Foundation. We helped start a venture capital fund in the West Bank about five years ago that uh, trying to create, you know, kind of a, a venture vehicle to invest in companies in Ramallah and other places to really create a, a, a sense of hope and opportunity, there, which is, I think, probably the only way to have any sustainable kind of peace or security you know, solution. You know, they are part of the reason people are, you know, so angry and frustrated is they don't have a sense of hope and opportunity. So that was one example. We just this past summer, uh, we spent some time, including with President Obama in Africa and Kenya and uh, Ghana and uh, Nigeria. Uh, and some of these countries are showing remarkable momentum around innovation entrepreneurship, both providing solutions for their communities, but also some of those solutions will end up having kind of global uh, impact in the process, you know, create more jobs. A lot of interest now in, in the last uh, few months in Cuba, that there's a whole kind of startup community building there. Only up until a few years ago, it was illegal to have a small business in Cuba. Now it's legal, but it has to stay really small. Uh, you, know, you can like have one restaurant, you can't have two. But you know, people are starting to figure that out, and the you know, rules will start getting relaxed, and that will be a, you know, you'll, you'll, you know, the, the, the entrepreneurial potential in, in places like that are are quite quite significant. So I do think it, it's sort of this idea of the regionalization and globalization of, of, of entrepreneurship does create more opportunity and lift communities in other places, whether it be Detroit or Lagos. Uh, and so I do think that's something that, that is a byproduct of, of, of trying to kind of level the playing field so entrepreneurs anywhere you know, have a shot. Yeah. So what, I have one more question before we go to the Q&A, which is, uh, so if you look back on your experience at Williams, um, can, you, can you think of, point to one thing that, that seems in retrospect to be the most important in kind of preparing you for the for the life and the career that you've had, and, and was that putting on the concerts with John Svoboda? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a bunch of things. Actually, it, 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 interestingly, the book I, I just finished writing, it comes out in a month or so, it talks about some of this. And even the, you know, the intro quote, I mean, before you actually get into the book, is the you know, quote, on, I'm sure you all remember, on, from Mark Hopkins on the Hopkins Gate. Uh, uh, and and that, that sort of, to me, has always been a uh, kind of a centerpiece of you know, kind of this idea of going far and really kind of reaching for the, you know, kind of the, the stars. Uh, it also talks about one of how I almost didn't graduate from Williams <laughs> because I took a computer class in my senior year and hated it. <laughs> and this was still the era of like punch cards where you like, you know, do some stupid little program and, and you hand your cards over and like four hours later, you know, they, you know get back and, you know, oh, you made a mistake, you have to go do it over again. Yeah. And I, I thought, hey, but some, I, I, there was something about that, that I, I, the instinct that there was something really powerful there, but it was the process of doing it was way too complicated. I think that was some, one of the things I, I, I took away from it. And I did a bunch of entrepreneurial businesses there, and I also was reminded and put in the book that there was actually an editorial in the Williams record that basically criticized me <laughs> for being an entrepreneur. I said, somebody said, basically, it said something like, I never will go to a Steve Case concert or uh, some other thing because I 
despise rampant laissez-faire capitalism on the campus. <laughs> But it's changed a lot. I did. I was back a few, a few years ago. I taught a winter study, a much more, more entrepreneurial. So, and the other one I'd say it ties in a little bit the leadership issue and policy issue. I did take a, a seminar with James McGregor Burns on, on leadership, which I learned a lot. I don't think he thought I learned a lot. I was, I was, I was, I was a little mortified. Walter Isaacson wrote this book a year or so ago called The Innovators, and one of the you know, profiles was of, of me, and he actually quoted. Burns is saying I was one of his median students, <laughs> which I think he was trying to be as polite as he, as he could be. So there are a mix of, of different things I, I, I took away. Well, so uh, have some questions if, if you have questions for our, our rampant laissez-faire capitalists. Yeah, exactly. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, I'm going to call on people. We have some folks with mics, and because we're recording, and if you can refrain from asking a question until you get the mic so that we can record it, that would be Wonderful. So with that, anyone? Yeah. Yeah, hang, hang on, Ben. Your vision for the f yeah. your vision for the future presupposes a functioning society with the <laughs> yeah, uh, with the uh, growing separation of the classes in the United States, the disappearance, the middle class, and our inability to deal with poverty, right. one might be concerned about the future of whether we will have this. And I welcome your thoughts on those problems. I share the concern. I share the concern. I think the issue of uh, income, income inequality, or basically this opportunity gap is another way to think of it, has widened. There's no question about it. The data is pretty clear on that. And part of the reason we're so passionate about some of these initiatives like the Rise of the Rest is how do you give people more opportunities and more places? And how do you focus more entrepreneurs on tough social problems, social challenges that actually can help improve people's lives while also creating businesses? And that ties in with some of the things on, on impact investing. And a lot of the things we are looking to invest in are trying to figure out ways to kind of close that gap and provide more, uh, more opportunity. But I think left to its own devices, things are going in a way, in a direction that is difficult and challenging and you know, reason to be concerned. I just, as an entrepreneur, I'm optimistic that people will come up with, with, with solutions that actually can improve how we you know, learn or how we stay healthy or get well when we get sick or how we, what and how we eat you know, that will uh, create interesting businesses, but also in the process, you know, help a lot of people that do feel, you know, left behind. I think this election is a good example of, of how you know, a lot of a good percentage of the country feels like they're being left behind. And whether it's on the Republican side or the Democrat side, there's clearly that, that voice that feels frustrated and, and angry uh, and, and left out. And we have to figure out ways to do it. I don't think technology is the magic solution. Sometimes people think if you just sprinkle a little technology on any problem, it will Go away. I think it's a much more complicated you know, problem, but supporting more, you know, this, you know, these ideas around the rise of rest, the ideas around impact investing, I think is a way to start, you know, dealing with that. And some of the companies we're most proud of have you know, created thousands of jobs uh, for a lot of people that were left behind. So it's not just about, you know, creating value for shareholders. It's also about creating value, including jobs for, for communities. Greg. No, uh, I know Greg Avis. Everybody knows Greg Avis. Member of the, uh, fellow member of the great class of 80, and, and your concerts were awesome, by the way. <laughs> cheap trick for you younger uh, folks here. Remember cheap I trick? did get called into <laughs> President Chandler's office at one point because we had some concert in Chapin Hall. I'm trying to remember which it was. It might have been Jay Giles' band or something. And they, they uh, was this? Was that Dar? Was that Dar? Yeah. No, I, I, we did that one too, but the, the, the one I remember getting in trouble for appropriately, is they had decided the stage at Chapin Hall was insufficient for their setup, and so they extended the stage. And they did that by building a platform and nailing the platform to the, <laughs> the, the first row or two of, of seats. And, uh, and you know, the president was uh, 
kind but firm <laughs> in suggesting that was uh, not an appropriate use of Chapin Hall. And I believe for about a year we were banned from doing concerts in Chapin Hall. But anyway, what you Well, we've just renovated Chapin Hall. The stage is bigger, so if the All Jay right. Giles band wants to come All back, right. we're, we're good for them. Sorry, Greg, okay. your question. Steve, just as a follow-up to the previous question, can you talk about the role of diversity in your, the third wave, gender, ethnic? You talked a little bit about immigration, but obviously it's a big issue here in Silicon Valley, and how do you see diversity playing an important role? In, in no, I think, I think it's, a, it's both a problem but also an opportunity. And, and some of it is in, from a fairness, almost morality standpoint, kind of leveling the playing field, giving everybody a shot, but also from a just capitalizing on all the great people with great ideas is the best way to lift up the communities, ultimately lift up the, the nation. And the data, is, as you know, is actually terrible. You know, I, I talked about 75% of, of venture capital going to three states, about 90% goes to men. Uh, and African Americans, uh, Latinos are, are in single digits in terms of the amount of, you know, of capital they're, they're getting. So it's not fair. It basically, most of the capital goes to white guys who went to great schools. That's true. And, and so it, it, how do you make sure, and, and even some of the, you know, the successful companies like a, a Facebook, started by, as you know, Mark Zuckerberg, at Harvard, and he got the capital because he had a rich friend across the hall. Not everybody is at Harvard, and not everybody has a rich friend. And how do you give them, if they had the idea of Facebook, you know, that shot? So I think it does tie in this uh, you know, idea of, of kind of moving the playing field. It, you know, you'll see there's much more diversity in these rise of the rest regions. Uh, in, some, in some areas like Atlanta, New Orleans, it's really you know, quite, uh, quite remarkable. Uh, and that's, you know, there's reason to be hopeful there. And there's a data point that is uh, very encouraging, which basically says if you do level the playing field, and it's about the strength of the idea, not what you look like or who you know, that much more capital flows. And the place to look at this is the crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter, Indiegogo. About half of the successful projects on those platforms have a, a female co-founder. Half yet only about 10% of venture capital is going to, to women. So that suggests that if you can present the ideas by having a little video and saying, here's my whatever it you know, might be, uh, and the, the capital flows more broadly. Uh, and it, similarly, if you are able to put your idea out there, whether you're in Palo Alto or Detroit, you know, capital flows more broadly. And it's only a matter of time before that, you know, that process accelerates. We're just trying to do everything we can to accelerate a little bit faster by promoting the rise of the rest, promoting kind of a diversity in terms of things we do, particularly around impact and investing. And it's showing some early signs of, of momentum. It's a big problem. Other questions? Uh, yeah, yeah, Michael. Um, Daryl, have you got the? Right here. Um, I thought your comment about the policy was really interesting. It's not something I thought about a lot. And in particular, when you said that uh, a lot of the newer technology companies tend to act selfishly when they come into the policy domain in, in DC, uh, it, was, it sounded almost like other companies who are not technologies are acting less selfishly and acting somewhat more broadly. Is that actually the case? And if so, like, what are some of the lessons for the technology companies as they get into that? Well, it's a little bit of the case because some of the other you know, industries or sectors, I think, have had a better understanding about the importance of policy. Biotech, for example, it's, you know, they, they're frustrated by the approval process, the FDA, other things, but they understand that's part of the, they're not going to be allowed to sell a drug that doesn't work or might kill people. So they, there's sort of a, just a recognition in that in the food industry. You know, people, you know, don't, a lot of people say, I don't want regulation, but they also don't want to make, you know, have their kids go to school and eat food that makes them sick, and they don't really want a, like a drone landing in their kid's playground and you know, <laughs> smashing into their head, and they don't really want to you know, get on, they, I, know, I hate regulations, but I, I actually want to get on a flight. I, I better make sure that the engine's been checked and the pilot's been licensed because I don't want to crash and die. So there's sort of this <laughs> dynamic where we, we're a little bit, you know, kind of there's a frustration at one level about the policy, the regulation, but also a, a understanding of the importance at an, another level. And other industries are a little bit better. There is a problem, though, in, 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 in Washington, which is most of the focus, including of the lobbyists, is about helping the incumbents stay incumbents. You know, there's a weird dynamic where most, most of the young companies, startups, start as attackers. And then if they're really successful, become defenders. And the defenders want to 
protect the status quo. They kind of like the gig, and how do they keep that, you know, that going? And so a lot of the focus is on putting policies in place that you know, essentially advantage the current winners and make it harder for the insurgents to, to attack. So the balance in this third wave is going to be figuring out what is the, how do you protect people, the way as I said, but not protect the incumbents. And if, and if anything, have a bias towards making it easier for the you know, upstart entrepreneurs who are challenging that, that, uh, that status quo. So everybody has to dance a little bit differently. I'm not saying anybody's you know, you know, perfect at this, uh, but I think, I think the recognition of the grower, more important aspect of policy, I think, is, is becoming more important. I mentioned Uber. They're a classic example of a company that basically was, was started ignoring government. Ignoring, but basically violating the laws on the books, and their basic policy was, you know, kind of the ask for forgiveness, not permission. Although actually, mm -hmm. they didn't ask for it either. They, <laughs> no, just, they, just, they actually did it. They just went, and it worked because it was a city by city effort, and they went, won some battles, lost some battles, but they had enough capital, enough momentum to you know keep going. It's actually gotten a lot harder for them in the last year or so because the battle has been nationalized in this country on some issues, and, and they actually were shut down in Germany. There were riots in the street of Paris. They had to stop, pull out of that, that market. South Korea, I think, has banned them. So it's sort of, it's one thing if policy is at a local level, and you just have to figure out how to you know, win a lot of individual battles, but if it's policy at more of the national level, it's much trickier. And the policy at, around health and education and food is generally more at the uh, at, the, at the national level or at some hybrid of the national and, and local level. So you're going to have to engage. And, oh, by the way, in these sectors like healthcare, it's one-sixth of our economy. Who is the largest customer of healthcare services? The government. So to ignore the government, not just as a regulator, but as a customer, is kind of stupid. You know, I think more entrepreneurs are recognizing that they have to engage. So we'll do one more question. Jeannie? Hi, I'm Jeannie Albrecht from the Computer Science Department, and I just want you to know we no longer use punch cards. <laughs> <laughs> Rest assured, your experience That's would be great. better. <laughs> yeah, it would be better now. Um, so my question about this third wave is a little bit more technical, and that's do you think that infrastructure, you said you can just assume that the infrastructure exists, um, do you think it's ever going to be a limiting factor, right? Because as, as things get more ubiquitous, you know, everything is connected to the Internet. The Internet was built long right. before, right, we thought things we're going to be connected that actually are? Like, do you think there's any, for technical people, like, should we be focusing more on some of these underlying things, right? Fixing the internet, right? Redesigning the internet rather than actually trying to figure out how to use these things that were built, you know, 30 years ago. I think there, there is going to be more of a need for that. There's some focus on that. I think the infrastructure, particularly the, you know, our national broadband infrastructure and mobile infrastructure is not great compared to other, other countries. So there is a need to invest in and more of that, and there are a bunch of initiatives to, you know, to, to do that. So yes, I agree that you have to continue to invest in building the, the foundation, but a lot of the entrepreneurial you know, interest is going to be in, in these different sectors. And some people call talk about the notion of the Internet of Things and sensors and other kinds of devices. I think in this third wave, it's actually going to be the Internet of Everything. It's going to be a much broader platform of, of products and services, a much broader kind of array of, of innovation. And it, it, there could be some limiting factors, but right now, if I look at some of the things we're talking about in education, healthcare, it's generally not limited by the core infrastructure. It's limited either by capital flowing to that particular idea or the regulation not quite being right to, to you know, support, the, unleash that, that next you know, wave of, uh, uh, of innovation. So will there be more need to be, continue to buttress and beef up and strengthen the core foundation? Sure, uh, but there also is more of a need to recognize that the you know, the game is changing a little bit. Again, I'm not suggesting that if you, you know, somebody tomorrow can't come up with a new photo app like Instagram or something, and maybe it's going to get a lot of success. But I think the, you know, the, they, they all said about Wayne Gretzky, the great hockey player, the reason he was great, he didn't focus on where the puck was. He focused on where the puck was going. He just got there a little bit faster than other people. I think the entrepreneurs in the third wave are going to need to recognize that it's not just about the apps. It's about really important aspects of people's lives, like health and learning and food and stuff like that. And it's going to require this more nuanced approach where, where a product still matters, people still matter, platforms still matter, but partnerships also matter, policy also matters, and frankly, perseverance also matters. These, these, these are more difficult challenges. There, there are going to be fewer overnight successes. You know, there will be much more. Like AOL, we, I used to joke that we were a 10-year-in-the-making overnight success. 
we were struggling and struggling and slogging and slogging and pivoting and pivoting and firing and hiring and you know constantly for, until finally after like 10 years we finally got some some momentum and that dynamic is going to be more more common in the in the third wave as well and i'll just leave on one last note as i said that the reason williams is such a wonderful place is some of the skills that are that are taught uh, at, at uh, places like Williams are some of the skill sets that are going to always be important, but be particularly important in this third way because of the importance of things like policy and partnerships and being able to see new possibilities and connect dots in new kinds of, of ways and rally people through you know, communication skills to believe in that idea and, and pursue that, that direction. Um, so it's great to see you all. It's great that you're doing these events all around the country. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Now, before we do that, I'm going to give you some instruction because you're all going to thank Steve, and then you won't hear the other thing I have to say. So, uh, as soon as we're, I hope we're, thank Steve. we're done, we're done. You know, no, you did pretty well. So, we'll uh, there's a gate in the back there. So, as soon as we're done, we're going to go to the reception, which starts immediately, and we actually don't go down and around. We go out the back and through that gate that's now open. It takes us right over to the Bentley Reserve. So, I just wanted to say that. And thank you, Steve, for really a terrific. Thank you all.